If you had to guess the most hated subject in the country, would you guess maths? Well, if you would, then you are completely right. I actually loved maths, but I know a lot of people do hate it. I got a grade 9 in my GCSE maths, A star in A level maths, A level further maths. And in this video, I'm going to be taking you through the strategies that really helped me to understand different concepts throughout GCSEs, throughout A levels, and which I'm still using because I still have maths paper and statistics paper in my end of university exams, the first year exams, I wish I was going to know, end of first year exams at Cambridge, which are happening now for this paper in a week and three days. So I'm going to be taking you through what you should be doing when you're initially learning a concept in order to really get it into your head, but also what you should be doing to develop your understanding of a concept, to really get to grips with it and to then convert your sort of understanding of the baseline, what it is, into being able to actually answer exam style questions and being able to tackle really tricky questions where they throw in twists, where they make things harder, those sorts of questions that are going to be the difference between you getting a seven and a nine or between getting a B and an A star. I'm going to be starting with what you should be doing if you're learning new material. If you're in the process of revising for exams, I would suggest you skip forward to the bit where I'm going to talk about how you're consolidating. But if you feel like you are actually coming across new things in your revision, then absolutely stay and watch this bit as well. So a lot of the time when you're going to be exposed to a new concept, it's going to be in class. The best thing that you can do is read a little bit forward. And I'm not saying learn the concept before you get to class. No, I'm not saying that at all. What I am saying is take a moment to watch a video about it. Take a moment to read through the next chapter of your textbook. You don't have to be attempting the questions, just glance over the worked solutions, watch somebody you know, explaining how to answer the question. It's not going to make perfect sense to you. You're not going to be able to go away and solve loads of questions on this topic. But what you are going to do is your brain is going to be priming itself. It's going to be getting familiar with the content. It's going to be understanding what some of the key terms are, what some of the key steps are. And that means that when you then get into class and are sort of exposed to them in context and being told, okay, this is how you actually use the idea, then it's not all completely new information. Your brain is not being overloaded. It's already got a bit of a baseline, which it can build on, and that will improve your ability to retain information after just one exposure. During class, if you're allowed to, please tell me you're allowed to, please try and take notes. In my school, I was not allowed to take notes. It was the most random rule ever. You couldn't get out a piece of paper and just started start taking notes because apparently that meant you weren't paying attention. But if you are allowed to, actually it's going to really increase your ability to understand and get to grips with that information. If you're writing down some of the key ideas, if you're writing down worked solutions, writing down any tips that you're given by your teacher, that sort of stuff is just going to be really reinforcing the most fundamental points about this new concept that you're learning. Yes, if you're trying to write down everything word for word, it's going to be distracting because you're not going to be thinking about things. But if you're sat there actively filtering information, thinking, okay, what are the most important points that I am being told and trying to write that down, that's going to be immensely beneficial. And what I would definitely, definitely say is you need immediate consolidation. That doesn't mean, you know, step outside the classroom and immediately get up some questions. What it does mean is within the same 24 hours that you learnt this new topic, that you were exposed to it for the first time, I want you to go away, I want you to revisit it. Whether that simply looks like reading over class notes and trying to, I don't know, use the Feynman technique to vocalise and explain, okay, what is this principle? How does it work? What are some of the steps to solving problems related to it? That works perfectly but if you do have the time you do have the ability to go and have a look at some really rather easy questions on it then i would absolutely say do that that's the case you know if you're given a new topic you're exposed to it in a lesson you're given some homework do that within the first 24 hours i know you're kind of like oh i don't want to i've got ages to do it but that immediate consolidation that helps you remember it, it helps you retain it. It means that you're not going to have to go back to that concept as frequently in future. And that is immensely important if you're revising and you're thinking, okay, I'm gonna learn this topic today, another topic tomorrow, another topic after that. After you've learned the topic today, tomorrow, whilst you're learning a new topic, come back to that topic that you learn today. Simply because going back to it immediately that's going to mean that you can then maybe go another week before you need to review it without forgetting stuff. Whereas if you didn't do that immediate consolidation, you'd forget roughly 90% of it within three to five days. You can't be having that. Now let's think about improving and consolidating your understanding over time. The most beneficial thing that I can recommend is to create cheat sheets. What cheat sheets look like are they are just you know, note pages that will have the concept, that will break it down, and that will enable you to be able to have something to glance at when you're stuck, that will give you a bunch of different solutions. Now you can either make these on sheets of paper, so I normally do these for more content heavy subjects as opposed to maths, and my cheat sheets look a little something like this. What I prefer for maths is to essentially take the way that this is formatted, you can see it's sort of lots of different boxes with different titles, and I basically take that and treat each one of those boxes as a flashcard. So I will make my flashcards 
on generally on good notes so that I can sort of handwrite everything. I find that a lot easier. And then every time that, for example, I come across a difficult question, I will make a flashcard that is that exact question. Question on the front, solution on the back. And you're thinking, you could just go back to the question, why would you do that? But we are low effort. Every time I want to practice a certain topic, I'm not going to go and retrieve the 10 different question packs that have the questions that I got incorrect in. I can just go to my flashcards, it has all of them in one, I can try and solve it, look at the solution, absolutely brilliant. And that is the most fundamental thing that I can recommend for you to do. Make flashcards, make cheat sheets, but don't only focus on questions you got wrong, also focus on actually what is the concept. Now, actually understanding what the concept itself is can be really quite difficult. So the best way that I've found to do that is to watch multiple videos by different people. So for example, during A-level maths, I might watch I might watch my sort of OCR videos and then I might also watch a uh, TL maths video and I might also look at a physics and maths tutor cheat sheet and I would do that for the same topic. So I'm looking at it in sort of three different ways, three different ways of explaining. So I know all of the angles, that I'm, I can be sure that I'm not just memorising what one textbook or one teacher or one person has told me, I'm actually challenging myself to think about what is this underlying concept, how does it actually work? And I think one of the sort of best mechanisms of doing this is to ask yourself different things. So as you're going through practice questions, I want you to be creating what if scenarios. So say you're doing a question and you know, all the numbers are positive. Okay, what if they were negative? How would that change my methodology? How would that change the result? What if you changed a certain coefficient? What if there was a coefficient on one of the variables? It's these sorts of things that I know can sound very abstract as I'm sat here telling them to you right now. But when you get and you see a problem in front of you, you're going to understand what I mean. It's as simple as, you know, a question asks you to sketch a quadratic. Okay, yeah, you can do it. What if the coefficient of x squared was different? What if there was, um, you know, a, a term in x? How is that going to change the way that you draw that graph? And if you're able to do that, if you're able to manipulate a question and derive an answer from it, that is when you really know you understand the material. Now, in terms of actually doing practice questions, that is obviously going to be the way that you replicate the exam the most and you really make sure that you can take the concept that you've just learned and apply it. The way that I would recommend you to do this is basically a four step process. You start off with the easy questions, the questions that are just asking you very, very simple things. I found that the best place to find these were Corbett Maths. They have those five a day and they also have like these like groups of five for different topics and they're really quite easy. And they are really good for just getting your basic fluency around a certain topic. Once you've got this basic fluency, then I want you to go and try some varied questions. So for example, looking at places like Physics and Maths Tutor or Madas Maths, again, separated by topic. Most importantly, when you're going through topic-based question packs, do one question, and then immediately mark that question. If you do loads of questions, then and then mark all of them, you run the risk of making the same mistake in every single one of those questions. So even if you get to the mark scheme and go, oh, I've made the same mistake in every question, your brain, in having made the mistake in every question, is going to have been reinforcing that process of answering these questions that is incorrect, and you don't want to be doing that. So if you make a mistake in the first question, you'll catch it immediately when you go to mark it, so that you won't be then repeating that mistake in the second question. So as you are doing varied questions, that is really, really important. Then for certain topics, you want to be moving on to more worded questions. I find that textbooks are normally the best place to find these. Alternatively, to look at past papers, um, they'll have these like wordier, longer questions that force you to pick out the information that tells you, that designates, okay, this is the actual topic area in maths that you're going to be asked about. And you need to have practice of these because these are the questions that separate those top students from those students who aren't quite there. And if you're able to answer those questions, you're going to be pushing into that sort of top student category. And the fourth way of your sort of this, let's call it like the maths learning ladder or whatever, is challenge questions. These are questions that explicitly go beyond what you're doing. So if you're doing GCSE, these might be easy A-level questions. If you're doing A-level, these might be math or step questions. And I'm not saying, okay, you absolutely need to be able to go away and answer all of these questions, because particularly if you're looking at step questions, math questions, they are designed to be challenging. But the, the sort of process of trying these super challenging questions not only gets you used to the feeling of, okay, I'm doing a question and I don't really know where to begin. I need to critically think about this question. What is it asking me to do? Just in case you get into that maths exam, and you're sat there thinking, oh, I have no idea what's, do what's going on, my mind is going blank, this is so stressful, 
you will have practice of having answered questions under those conditions, which is going to make it a lot easier for you to focus, recall information, and also doing harder questions makes the style of questioning that you're going to get in your exam feel slightly easier. That can be a great confidence boost, and it can make you more willing to actually practice maths, because the more you practice it, the better you'll get at it, as with anything. Now, equally important as attempting lots of questions is making sure you're analysing your mistakes correctly. So that doesn't just mean, OK, I got it wrong, let me look at the mark scheme, OK, that was the correct answer, and I'll write the correct answer. That doesn't really help. So at the end of every single session where you're studying maths, I want you to go back to all of those questions that you got incorrect and I want you to retry them. Retry them from the start. And yes, you might think, oh, I'm just, you know, I basically memorised what was in the mark scheme. That's so fine because what you're doing is you're forcing your brain to rethink the way that it's answering that question to give the thumbs up to these correct methodologies and sort of not place as much emphasis on the incorrect things that led you to getting that incorrect answer. You want to be reinforcing only those correct neural pathways in your brain. And on this, particularly if you are in the lead up to exams, I would recommend keeping a bit of a mistake log. This isn't necessarily, you know, writing out the exact question that you got wrong. But for example, if the question was about, I don't know, matrices, then you would note down, OK, I got this question wrong about matrices because I didn't understand how to find the cofactor or something like that. And you just note down what topic area the question was that you got wrong and why you got it wrong. And then you can create a log, you can group sort of similar topics together, or the same, like all the things you got wrong for the same topic together, look at why, and then you might be able to identify patterns. Okay, do you consistently get questions wrong about finding the inverse of the matrix? Okay, therefore, you need to go away, you need to study that, you need to practice it a little bit more. And what this also does is this sort of column that is reasons why you got the question wrong is basically a big cheat guide of all the things that you commonly get wrong that you don't want to be getting wrong in the exam. So if you look over that in the morning of an exam, you're going to have fresh in your mind all of those really common mistakes that you make so that you can look out for the, them in the exam and not make those mistakes. And even if you're not doing that consciously, your brain is doing that subconsciously, which is still going to be massively beneficial. So that is how you're going to be studying for maths really effectively to help you get the best grades possible in your maths exams. If you have any questions, do let me know. And as ever, I will see you in the next video.